I can start my stopwatch here, then I'll likely finish on time. Otherwise, I just keep talking. Um, I have been working actually in technological innovation since uh, I was an undergraduate. I actually did my undergraduate history honors thesis on the changes in international law that followed the development of the U-boat in the First and Second World War, and, and how changes in technology change our concepts of ethics and morality and then our concept of law. So innovation is something I've worked on uh, ever since. Uh, let me talk about performance code. This is a performance code. Builder builds a house of man, not the house he builds fall the fallen, the cause of death is owner, the builder shall be put to death. That's a performance code. Anything else is crap. Okay, anything else is not performance in the real world, it's performance on some kind of test or standard. Regulators all over the world try to balance innovation and fire safety, not too much, well balanced, but under pressure from the economists, they want safety testing to certify products for worldwide shipping. Nobody cares about safety, everybody cares about whether they're certified. They want tests that can be run by idiots. Um, safety can be analogized to a bicycle lock. To bicycle designer, locks are distinctly secondary to performance. You don't see them in the Olympics. Locks don't sat help the designers satisfy primary customer requirements. They don't make them faster, lighter, easier to use. That's the problem we have. We're in the bicycle lock business. And, and we just have to convince people that bicycle locks are important. Technical regulation tends to work most effectively in areas that are technologically stable. Regulators build up experience, they understand the problems of the regulation. Most testing derives from the history of quality control, which is also an area of stability, where tests were developed in this technical and social stability. So they want tests that can be run by idiots. First suits of armor were proved by shooting standard bullets at them, and since then they tried to develop tests that can establish whether specified levels of safety, regulatory levels, have been reached. That's the E-162 rating and panel test used in the United States. Anybody notice anything really weird about that picture? That's me. I'm the author. I was working for Jim Gutierrez in 1973, running the radiant panel, that, and, and Jim Gutierrez was the person who turned my, you know, my interest to the area of regulatory standards. So, as I said, they could be run by idiots, and I was his example. All right. So, he says, as a fire engineer, I, I'm a professor in the Department of Fire Protection and Engineering. As a fire engineer, I'm a very good lawyer. So, but at Mont Blanc, uh, we already talked about Mont Blanc, thanks uh, for setting it up for me. A 39 people killed in a massive fire with a truck carrying margarine and flour. Most interesting thing was how many people were sort of amazed that you could get such a big fire out of it after all. It's classified as low hazard. Could the tunnel designers and the regulators share a lethal confusion on the issue of what might be called, in my work, the ignitability versus the flammability of the relevant materials. Ignitability is essentially the ignition tendency of specific objects to ignite easily when you expose it to flames of various size, whereas flammability, again, this is for the purposes of my work, I realize other people use these terms differently, the effective heat of combustion or caloric potential, that's how much stuff you have there. You notice when he simulated margarine, he used heptane. Well, heptane's not allowed in that tunnel. All right? Because that's a hazardous cargo, right? Wood shavings and solid wood have similar flammability, the shavings are more ignitable. But it all depends on which attribute is critical, and that's the regulatory problem. We're always looking at the wrong attributes. The difference between ignitability and flammability, it's critical to safety and regulatory process, but typical performance standards, they routinely don't indicate which attributes they're using. What are they measuring when they say this? You know, what are they looking at? How important is it? For example, the, the margarine truck in the test in 1999, uh, you know, the caloric potential of margarine, you know, 900 gigajoules or something, is it, it not hazardous cargo because it passes a test based on ignitability. All right, that's just one of the problems, which is they look at the wrong attributes when they're setting regulatory standards. The other thing, and this is something we fight constantly in the fire biz, is they confuse the cause of the ignition with the cause of the disaster. For legal, political, financial, PR reasons, the source of the ignition. People always talk about that as the cause of the disaster. But from a fire safety design perspective, the ignition is not really relevant. It's the initiating event. The disaster occurs because you can't control the ignition event. The Hindenburg. Who cares what caused the spark? You put 7 million cubic yards of hydrogen together in a gas bag. 
and you're eventually going to do this to it. That's the fire problem, not where, other than the silly idiots who think that it was the fabric. But, but not, you know, not where the spark came from, you're always going to get a spark. Now, after a disaster, blaming the ignition source for the catastrophe is an attempt to divert attention to the failure to plan effectively for a spreading fire. This will happen in a performance-based design building in not, not very long. Now, they'll do anything to avoid the fact that they didn't take care against the disaster. Since we can't prevent ignition, we have, to re we have to structure the entire system to deal with the ignitions we're going to have. Next problem we have. We have disaggregated regulation of complex integrated problems. This is from the World Trade Center report on, um, on um, number seven, the class number seven just came out, that the E-119 just doesn't capture critical behavior of the structural system. An entire regulatory system built on a test method that NIST is perfectly happy to say now, we all knew back then, it doesn't have any meaning in this context. You can't act as a building a very complex thing. My father protested the construction of the World Trade Center when it was built on this ground. Yeah, so that's, that's what happens. So regulating innovative technology, we have an additional problem. And this is where the interaction of the lawyers and regulators is a particular problem. For example, the regulators are trying to decide whether to allow bicycles in traffic. So the question is, what do you think of when you think of bicycles? All right, that's the bicycle. That's what the symbols look like, what the pictures look like. So they write regulations about bicycles in traffic, and the engineers come up with this. Now that meets the technical definition of a bicycle, but it involves an entirely new road hazard because the bicycle and the rider are no longer intervisible. Either the rider or the bicyclist can no longer see and be seen. It's a totally novel hazard generated by an innovation that's completely in compliance with the performance standard. And that is the problem that we just call innovation risk. Innovation risk is the ability to create a product that meets the technical requirements of regulation or test, represents a novel hazard. And innovation risk exists in all types of performance testing. So innovation is the greatest challenge to any test-based regulatory system. The ability to create a new product is not always connected with the ability to understand its risks and develop an appropriate test. You may not even know you have a problem since the effect of the innovation may not be clear. So innovation, is, I mean, this is one of the real problems, what I do as a problem, which is innovation in the, in the performance test environment, is the reason the economists say we should adopt performance tests because they allow innovations. All right? And nobody says, yeah, but which innovations do they allow and which ones do they prohibit because the innovation generates new risks? They don't want to hear about that. The normal answer, what you have to do almost always, when you have an innovation risk, which is where we have performance standards, is you have to have a regulator with adequate discretion and expertise. You have to examine each innovative product or situation to determine whether the regulatory test is adequate to describe the risk arising from the new product. But first of all, it's not easy to do. And second, they don't want it because they all want to have the new it. That's why we have the mortgage credit scandals. Those are all innovative products. Wasn't that wonderful? They were making money hand over fist. Except they were, they were making the money by taking on risk that nobody was recognizing. It's exactly the same thing that happens when they start playing with computer models and building buildings. They take on risk, get a big profit, walk away, and leave the disaster behind for the rest of us. 